Jackson is talking about, but also we want to hear from the Lord as well. So 1 Samuel chapter 17 will be what we'll look at next week, but I want to read it with us so that we're aware of it. So find 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll start in verse 20. When you find it, if you're able to stand to your feet, we'll read it together. First Samuel chapter 17, <clears throat> verse 20. Is this about David and Goliath? Is this passage, are these scriptures about David fighting a giant in his life? Tom's like, oh, kind of. <laughs> there is a larger... A larger picture. Yes, we can preach it as David overcoming a, a giant in his life. But it's always about the Lord, right? Always. Um, so as we read this, kind of think about David compared to Saul. Think about David and who he sees himself as. Think about who other people see David as. Think about what's happening with Goliath and God, not Goliath and David. Think about what's happening with Goliath and God. Think about what God is trying to do in this battle for the world. Think about the faith of Saul, the faith of David's brothers, and the faith of David as we read these passages. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 20, if you're there, say amen. Amen. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the enemy was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their line facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance and David heard it when the Israelites saw the man they all ran from him in great fear now the Israelites had been saying do you see how this man keeps coming out he comes out to defy Israel the king will give great wealth to the man who kills him he will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. Is that a blessing or a curse? No, just kidding, yeah? Uh -huh. All right, move on. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills the Philist this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him, what they had been saying and told him this is what will be done for the man who kills him when Eliab David's oldest brother heard him speaking with the men he burned with anger at him and asked why have you come down here and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is you came down only to watch the battle or to watch men die <laughs> kind of like why you go to a hockey game watch the fights right now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been fighting a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered, the, um, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this 
Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put on a coat of armor a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on the sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I can't go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of the shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming nearer or closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. Hmm. As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell down to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Amen? Amen. This story is so much not about just David overcoming a giant. Did you see all that's in there? Did anybody see it? I want you to dissect it this week for next week because we're going to get to it. And we're going to see what it truly means to live the life that God's purposed you to live. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. Father, help us to understand that we have been uniquely created. We have been put together, knit together by you in our mother's womb. We have been made for a purpose in life to bring you honor and glory and to allow you to work through us the way that you've gifted us, the way that you've given us talents, likes, dislikes, Father, the way that you have made us in your image. You use us to advance the kingdom of God that the whole world might know that there truly is a God in heaven. Father, may you be glorified today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord in heaven. While you have your Bible out, turn to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to look at Jesus' baptism and the temptation in chapter 4 of Jesus in the wilderness. And I want to just talk for a moment for the next 38 days to you um, about ourselves. Knowing who you are in Christ. Knowing who you are in Christ. Being able to shed the old self, you know, the old is gone, the new has come. Be, being able to shed the old false self in order to live an authentic life as a new, true person in Christ is at the very heart of being spiritually, emotionally healthy. If you have no idea who you are in Christ and who God has designed you to be, you will miss out, honestly, in the life that God has purposed and planned for you, the abundant life that God desires to give you because you will not know who you are and you will be living a life that God is trying to to tell you is old and is gone. I don't know if you can relate, but as I grew up, I was pressured and I was conformed and I was pushed in certain directions in life by what other people thought I should be, what I should do. 
I remember many conversations in my grandmother's basement where I would sit around with my aunts and uncles in my early teens. What are you going to be when you grow up, Drew? What are you going to do? And then they would give me the, the litany. They'd give me the list of all the opportunities that I could have. If I go to this college, I could have a degree in this. Well-known schools. You can get into any job you want at any price that you ask for. You could get a salary that would allow you to live a life that gives you this, this, and this but true if you don't want to be this you could be this and you could go and have we got a little bit of this but a lot of this but just know if you choose this path you may have to deal with this so you might want to think it through and go this route over and over my aunts and uncles would try to tell me what i should be where i should go to school how i should live my life in the future and 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 clearly at no fault to, their, to, to themselves, they didn't know Jesus, right? They didn't understand the kingdom dynamics that God creates us specifically, intricately, and uniquely for his purposes. There is not another Yvonne McCoy in this world. There's not another Drew. And you might be saying, right, Yvonne, they're probably like, praise the Lord, right? But that's not what we should be saying. We should be saying, thank you, Jesus. There is nobody like you. There is nobody in the same race lane that God has you in. You are uniquely designed and gifted by the Lord to run your own race that he places you in, in your own race lane. You're not competing against anybody. But if we don't understand who we are in Christ, we ultimately end up living a life that is not our own. And we go to the grave at the end of our time, not fully realizing who we were or who we should have been or what we should have done in Christ Jesus and we live somebody else's life many of our parents are living their lives that they missed out on through us by telling kids to go to this school get this job because they were never afforded that opportunity but if I can get little Johnny or little Kim to go through this school and get that job man I can really kind of grab hold of some of that that glory that they'll partake of and I've always wanted to be a registered nurse or I've always wanted to be an airline pilot and they miss out those young ones miss out on living the life that God has for them how do you know who you are how do you know where your vocation should be how do you know what school to go to how do you know what you've been designed to do you have to have a relationship with the creator you have to be born again you have to have faith in jesus christ alone you have to be in the kingdom of god and ask the creator of the universe who knit you together in your mother's womb you have to ask him by spending time with him what did you design me for why do i like this and not like that why is it that i love to do these things but i don't like to do those things why am i bent towards this in life why do these things come so natural to me god and why do i love them so much well maybe it's because i've designed you to do these things but many of us never realize what that is because we live a false life because we're living through the desires the direction and the paths that other people have forced us or pressed us in and we don't truly know who we are. Anybody relate to that? Anybody ever, you know, maybe, maybe today you think that you've missed out on life because you've been living, even in your 60s or so, you're like, you know what, I truly wanted to do this in life, but I was pushed into this vocation or I was pushed into this. I really would have liked to have been a cabinet builder. I really would have liked to have been a pilot, but you know what, I'm a school teacher instead. Not that there's anything wrong with being school teachers, but if you're not driven and that's not your passion by design you're missing out or maybe you wanted to be a school teacher and now you're a i don't know a nuclear engineer i don't know not that there's anything wrong with those things but some people are doing things that they don't like doing because they never truly found out who they were in christ The, there's a quote in this book and it, it says the vast majority of us go to our graves without knowing who we are we unconsciously live somebody else's life or at least someone someone's others some others expectations for us this does violence to ourself our relationship with god and ultimately to others why because you're living a false you 
You're living a lie. And maybe you were told as you felt certain ways that you shouldn't feel this way. And so you clamored down, you shut up, and you got, went back into your shell, and therefore you went down the path that you went down because you were told that you are not allowed to feel. I'm not allowed to feel any kind of feelings that are not in line with the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, how many, how many people in churches have been told, you know what, you can't feel angry, you can't feel sad, you can't feel depressed, you can't have any of these feelings. You have to only feel love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. You only can feel and operate in the fruit of the Spirit because if you're not, then something is absolutely wrong with you. Anybody ever been told that? a conversation with a lady today that said the very same thing. I've been told my entire Christian life that I cannot have these feelings. And if I have these feelings, something is wrong with me as a Christian. Is it wrong to feel emotions? Is it wrong to feel sad? Is it wrong to feel angry? Is it wrong to feel anxiety or depression? Did Jesus feel? In his humanity, did Jesus feel? Jesus wept, did he not? Jesus, the Bible says that God is a jealous God. God is a God of joy. God was sorrowful that he created humanity, was he not? God in his humanity, Jesus in his humanity, felt emotions. He felt emotions. He wept. He was utterly tore apart in the Garden of Gethsemane. So much so that he sweat drops of blood. But many of us believe that we cannot feel certain ways, otherwise there's something wrong with us spiritually, and that we should just read one more verse or pray a little harder, get in your prayer closet, and all those angry feelings will go away. All those feelings of anxiety will go away. And so we suppress all those feelings, and we live a false life, and we never deal with why we feel angry or depressed or sad. And we come up with a rule in life that the minute I start to feel this way, I pull this rule out and it overshadows. I have to pray a little more. I have to operate in the, the fruit of the Spirit. And so what do you do? You work for it, right? You lie to yourself. You work for it. And what happens? You suppress all these feelings and eventually they ooze out over the top as poison venom and it kills relationships that are around you. It kills relationships in the family. It kills relationships at the workplace. You've seen people talk one way to somebody, roll their eyes, and talk another way right behind their back, right? You've seen actions, body actions, really scream something different than what somebody else is saying, right? You've rolled your eyes at your in-laws. You've rolled your eyes at your husband. Your kids have rolled their eyes at you, but yet they tell you how much they love you. When we suppress these feelings and we don't deal with them, we never truly get to understand who we are in Christ. God wants us to bring, like David did, right, all of his emotions to song and to, to prayer and to lay it bare before the Lord so that the Lord can show you what's the trigger that's causing this to happen in your life that you might combat it with the truth. Why are you so afraid when Carol Smith comes into your office, Drew? I'm not afraid of Carol, but I'm just saying. Because I have the fear of man. Well, the fear of man is a trap and a snare, the Bible says. What are you worried about? I fight all your battles, right? Don't you have faith in me? God wants you to bring those emotions to him that he might begin to tell you why you are acting and why you respond and why the triggers happen and shed the light of the truth of the scriptures that might show you who you truly are so that you can be transformed at the deepest root core and be something different because the old is gone, the new has come. Why carry around the old when Jesus tells us anyone in Christ is a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. And so God doesn't want you to suppress it, but he wants you to operate in them and bring them to him that he might explain to you why you are acting and feeling the way you are 
that you might be able to see the grace of God operate in the truth of God to help you understand there's no need to feel angry or sad or, or worried or anxious in these situations if you only know the truth. Sure, there are things that you can't avoid. You'll be sad if your dog dies, right? But things that cripple you keeping you from being who you've been designed to be in God, knowing truly who you are. If you never understand why you operate the way you do, you'll never be transformed and changed as you grow in the Lord. And you'll look the same over the course of years, repeating that one year of walking with the Lord over and over and over. And your habits that were formed in, in your teens and your 20s will repeat in your 30s and your 40s. And you're 50. It's amazing when you look in the mirror in your 40s, 50s, and 60s, and you see yourself as the 18-year-old little boy or girl that was hurt, broken, battered, or bruised back in the day, and you still carried it along with you because you've never allowed God to show you who you truly are in light of his truth. Jesus felt, Jesus also understood who he was in Christ and in the family of God, in the Trinity. So we have to understand that at Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3, it says in verse 13 of chapter 3, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come here to do me? Jesus replied, Let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, the heavens opened. God rent open or tore open the heavens at the beginning of Jesus's ministry and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him and a voice from heaven said this is my son this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased Jesus understood who he was this is before Jesus did any miracles. This is before Jesus did any ministry. This is before Jesus did anything for God the Father. Jesus didn't have a following. Jesus didn't have an entourage that said, hey, we give you props, you're the best. He had no followers yet. And yet God wants to show Jesus, just like he wants to show each and every one of us, who you are in God's unfathomable, unconditional love this is my son whom i love having done nothing having not entertained the cross having performed nothing this is my child whom i love and in him i am well pleased he is good and good enough from beginning to end even if jesus just said that's a wrap jack we are done my father loves me unconditionally i am his son whom he is well pleased with i said it. jesus wasn't trapped by anything because he knew who he was in the Trinity he knew he was dearly loved and he knew that God was well pleased with him and that is what God is trying to sound the five alarm bells to you is that he loves you unconditionally loves you he is well pleased with you you are good enough even if you don't serve in Awanas even if you say, you know what, Seth, I'm too busy to help in ministry this month, God's not going to check it against you and say, you know what, you've just slipped down a rung on the ladder. I don't love you as much anymore. God wants you to know that just as you are, just as you've been created in Christ Jesus, you are loved, dearly loved child of God. And he is well pleased with you. Don't have to do nothing. That to me is amazing that is amazing you mean if i live a life of hell and wantonness living then god's still pleased with me? not saying that it's a license to sin i'm saying that just as you are if you did nothing to perform if you did nothing to possess anything of this world it's not what you do what you possess 
or how you perform and get all the accolades. You are loved and you are well-pleasing to God as his child because that is what you are, a child of the king, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb of God. This allowed Jesus to live a life without the influence and persuasion of people. Think about all of this as you look at David and Goliath this week for next week. Look at Saul. Where does Jesus go after fully being affirmed in who he is and how much God loves him? God the Father loved. Where does Jesus go right after his baptism? Where does he go? Then Jesus was led by the Spirit of God, right, into the desert to be tempted by the devil. You mean the Spirit of God led Jesus to the desert to be tempted by the devil? Absolutely. And just as Jesus was led to the desert to be tempted, grab your bucket of sand because you're not excluded and exempt from going to the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy God prepared Jesus for the journey ahead you are my son and whom I whom I love and I am well pleased now let's take that theological truth and let's go play it out in the desert and do you truly believe what I've just told you and this is the thing a lot of us don't believe what Jesus is telling us, what God has told his son, what God is telling us that you are dearly loved and that, in, in, that God is well pleased with you. God leads Jesus. The Spirit of God leads Jesus, his dearly loved child, in whom he's well pleased, to the desert, where for 40 days he fasted, Right? After fasting 40 days, so he's a little weary, he's a little tired, he's a little weak. 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, the Bible says. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. What is the enemy going to do here? He's going to do exactly what he did to Jesus to us. Jesus, the Bible says that God, Jesus, was tempted in all points. Jesus was, was tempted in every single way that you and I will ever be tempted. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. In the wilderness journey here, Jesus is going to be tempted because the enemy does not give up on anybody who believes that they are loved by God and in, in whom God is well pleased with. The enemy wants you to believe that you're not good enough, you're not lovable, and you are not loved by God. And so the enemy will continue to toy with us just as he did with Jesus. But if you know who you are in Christ, if you know as Jesus did that he was loved and good enough, regardless of doing anything, it can get you through the wilderness. Jesus goes into the wilderness and the enemy comes up to him and says, hey, you know what? If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones here, to become bread now Jesus knows who he is right he knows he's loved the enemy is trying to tempt him with the temptation of performance I am what I do if you are the son of God I know you're hungry turn these rocks into bread perform for me let it be known who you are by what you do don't we fall into that trap hi Jason I'm Drew how are you good nice to meet you hey what do you do for a living isn't that the first question we ask people as if that changes who they are right he could be a shoe polisher does that change who he is does that change who God created him to be what if he was a neuroscience with a minor in uh, nuclear chemistry 
and a basket weaving degree. <laughs> Underwater basket weaving, which is really a degree. Anybody know? Um, this is just a side trick, but underwater basket weaving. Anybody know? Is that a real thing? Come on, you smart people. Is that a real thing? You've heard that, right? Anybody heard? Oh, you. What are you going to get a degree in underwater basket weaving? Anybody? Have you, have you heard that? Uh, am I crazy? That's a real. Uh, okay, I'm crazy, but that is a real thing. Underwater basket weaving. Does anybody know what they weave underwater as a basket? Hot air balloon baskets are made underwater. That's underwater basket weaving. That's just a little free one for you. Anyway. But that's a, that's a trap that we all get pulled into. We do. We all get pulled into, this is what I am. I am what I do. And so we go towards things that impress everybody around us. We're pushed in that direction because I am what I do. We want to tell people. We ask people, what do you do for a living? As if that makes any difference about their heart, their character, their integrity, and who they are <clears throat> in Christ Jesus. And Jesus even though he could have done that, would have been a, a major mistake because he would have never then got to the cross. Any of these things that he compromised in to take the shortcut that the enemy wants you to take avoids going to the cross. Jesus, let him know you're the son of God. Do it by turning this stone to bread. And Jesus says what? He combats them with the truth of Scripture. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that continually proceedeth from the mouth of the Father. How do you live when you're hungry, when you're fasting, when you're in the desert? You live by continually digesting the word of God, which continually proceedeth from the Father's mouth, constantly, continually. It's there for the taking. The enemy's not done with Jesus. He goes on. Goes on to temptation too. Jesus was taken to see all the magnificence and the power of the earth. Luke, or Matthew chapter 4, it goes on. And the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Well, well, let's do the other one first. He shows them the, the wonders of the world, the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And all this I'll give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. So the temptation here is that I am what I have. I am what I possess. Many people, the more that they have, the more that they put around them, the better cars they have, the better house, the finer looking husband that wears the Gucci clothes or the finer looking wife that's you know, all done up from a glow salon. The better and the better the, the things that I have, the more that I possess, that's truly who I am. That's why these marketing agents spend billions of dollars a year to send out mailers to you. Anybody look at those mailers in their mailbox anyway? You get 8,000 pages wrapped up in that little box underneath your mailbox. Yeah, anybody ever look at those? They could save an entire jungle if they just stopped sending us how to get prettier checks. I'm going to Mickey Mouse on my check. Or here's the new toothpicks. They're colored. Or here's a, a Domino's pizza coupon that expired two weeks ago because you never looked in your box for it. You know what I do with those mailings? I grab them all and I look to make sure there's no ring doorbells looking. And I put them in my neighbor's mailbox. So you deal with all those. I know pray for me it's 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 a hard thing no I don't, I don't do that i take them to my recycle bin don't even look at them and drop them right in there but jesus was tempted to say look you could have all of this because that's the temptation of the enemy to live a life that is not you in christ and live for this world by what you do and what you possess and what did what did jesus say to him what did he say to him Worship the Lord your God only, right? Because Jesus knew who he was. He knew that he wasn't the Father. Jesus was set for success in this temptation because he knew who he was, dearly loved, and God was well pleased with him. So the enemy says, hey, let me take you up to the highest point. If you truly are the Son of God, jump off. Won't he command his angels? to come and save you? What temptation is this? This is the sin of what other people think about you. Popularity. Hey, if you perform and jump, everyone's gonna 
like you. Popularity. And that is exactly how we live as well. Who's going to like me because I'm around this person? Who's going to like me because I've married this person? How popular can I be if I go to this school or get this job? But because Jesus knew who he was, he avoided all of this. It is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In a sense, Jesus knew it wasn't about him. David and Goliath it was about the father and he had a specific mission for the, his son whom he loved dearly and in whom he was well pleased even before he did anything Jesus says I want to direct everybody to my father and so what happened the enemy left Jesus right the spirits came and ministered to him and the enemy waited for a more opportune time to come back and tempt Jesus. Jesus didn't really put a high value on what other people thought of him, did he? Jesus cared mainly about what his father thought of him. And that is where we need to rest in pleasing our Father. Did Jesus disappoint people? Yeah, he did. Is it okay to disappoint people? Is it okay to say no, Seth? Well, not for Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> do you want to say no? Jesus left his family of earthly origin, right? He was a carpenter in this family. Jesus left them to go on a mission to go to the cross. He disappointed his family. He disappointed his brothers. He didn't do what his brothers said to do because even his brothers didn't believe who he was. He disappointed them. Jesus disappointed his, the, the people that were very close to him. Jesus disappointed the 12 disciples, did he not? They thought that he was going to be this earthly ruling king that would bring them out of the oppression of the people. That's what everybody thought. Save us from Rome. Save us from this political oppression. Save us. Well, we won't go there today. Anyway, save us, right? And he said, I have to go to the cross. I'm going to die. He disappointed those guys. Jesus disappointed the people that he didn't heal. Jesus disappointed the people in the towns. In fact, they wanted to throw him off cliff. Jesus disappointed the Pharisees, did he not? He threw a monkey in their wrench, their way of living, their religion. They got so mad that they attributed, they said, you know why this guy operates in this power? He's getting this from the enemy. His power is from Beelzebub. Jesus disappointed them. Is it okay to say no to people, to slow down, to be with God, to find out who you truly are in Christ Jesus, that you might truly find out the purpose and plan that God has for you to live out by saying no to other people? Is it okay? Is it okay that someone might be disappointed? Absolutely, it is. Do we want to make a habit of that? I don't know, it depends how busy you are. Jesus is the model of somebody that spent time with the Father. Even in Mark, when he was healing all that came to him, and he was doing ministry to the wee hours of the night, it said that Jesus got up very early in the morning the next day. What is that, a two, three-hour window? And Jesus got with the Father continually to make sure he understood who he was that he was on the right track with the mission that he was called to, to bring glory and honor to the Father. Jesus spent time in his relationship with his dad. That's why he was able to handle those disappointed people. That's why he never really got upset and angry other than with the money changers. Jesus knew how to handle the feelings that he had in his humanity with the truth of the word of God. He understood in that quietness of spending time with God that his emotions were just triggers to things that probably shouldn't be. 
he was feeling. If, if we have triggers of anxiety and fear, there's just something that's not right. We don't have the truth of what God truly says about the situation. So we live in this anxiety, this depression, this fear, this worry, this hatred. And we never come to the Lord. And so we're really not ready for any of the journey that God has for us because we do not live the true self that God has us designed in, His image. And we're doing it by ourselves. Some of us just want a little more Scripture, a little more Scripture. How's that working for us? A little more Scripture, a little more Scripture, a little more Scripture, a little more Scripture. How about getting bare before the Lord and saying, this is how I'm feeling, Lord. Okay, I know I need a Scripture, but this is how I'm feeling. Can you tell me why? What scripture, what scripture helps me understand why I'm being this way? And why don't I trust you? Why don't I think that there's going to be enough money in the bank account this week? Why don't I believe that you will be the God who provides and protects and is my God of provision? Why don't I believe that? Well, this is why, Drew. But you never understand that if you never spend time and slow down with the Lord God Almighty. And you'll constantly be living by the voices of those around you, being forced and pressured and conformed to other people's images. And they will try to get you to be exactly who they want you to be because they're only out for themselves. When God says, I am out for you, and I have planned a mission and a vision for your life, and I've gifted you and specifically given you these talents, likes, and dislikes for a reason... Will you listen to me? Will you spend time with me? That you can shed the old self and grab hold of the new self and truly live free instead of living as a slave to me, not knowing who you truly are. Many of us live as slaves to Christ out of duty, not knowing who we are because we will not come before him and truly let him heal us in our hurts, our habits, our hang-ups, because we suppress all of our feelings, bring out rules that help us get beyond it, and we live a life that is a lie. That is not what Jesus has for you in the abundant life. Next week, we'll look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll look at David compared to Saul again. We'll look at little shepherd boy compared to King Saul. We'll look at the faith of Saul compared to the faith of David. We'll look at how each of them view themselves in God as servants to God. We'll look at who's living a true life in Christ, and we'll look at somebody who's living a life for themselves, unaware of all their failings and what that brings through the battle of David and Goliath. So for next week, look at those things of David. Look at the battle of David and Goliath from a heavenly perspective, a faith perspective of somebody that knows or doesn't know who they are in God and ask yourself am I David or am I Saul am I truly living how God's purposed and planned my life to be or am I living according to what everybody else says I should be there's freedom in Christ God loves you and in him, he is well pleased with you. The key to all of this is a relationship with Jesus Christ. None of this makes any difference if you do not have a saving relationship with God Almighty. How do I do that, Pastor Drew? I've messed up. My life's a wreck. It's upside down. I've, I've lived a life for everybody else but myself. I don't even know God. I believe that Jesus is God. Great. That's the first step. Admit. Admit you're a sinner admit that jesus is the son of god knowing that you can't save yourself no matter how hard you try you are a sinner at best right you always miss the mark of god you can't go to the cross because you're not the perfect lamb of god you are tainted with sin you can't take the sins of anybody let alone pay for the sins of yourself jesus the perfect lamb of god who's never sinned but has been tempted in all points and yet is found without sin went to the cross to pay your penalty of sin that you couldn't pay. And he shed his blood. He died. The perfect Lamb of God gave his life that by faith in him alone, 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 
Faith in Jesus alone to forgive you of your sins is all you need to do. Is place your trust in Jesus to forgive you of your sins alone, and He will forgive you if you say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I am a sinner. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. And those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? And you begin the journey of knowing your true self in Christ Jesus. I pray as you look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 that God begins to show you how dearly loved you are and how He is well pleased with you and how to fully trust Him for the journey and the battles ahead. You are victorious in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for this opportunity to hear Your Word. And I pray as we come to You next week, Lord, that You begin speaking to us even this week Monday, as we open up 1 Samuel and look at David and Goliath with fresh eyes. Lord, help us to see how to live a life of faith, to live a life as you've purposed us, as you've created us to be, that is a child that is dearly loved, and that is a child in whom you are well pleased. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us stand to our feet. We'll sing a song.